may be seated. Yamo Yitzhak Egutachan ala Torah. Well, as often happens with my Shamashim, sometimes they have a little something percolating. And uh, Vic, Vic is, uh, Vic is, uh, as you know from time to time, has, has, has been blessing us with uh, uh, something that's in, uh, uh, given to him by the Holy Spirit and imparted to him, so he wishes to share it this morning. So I said, all right. So thank you again, Shamash Potash. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, and Rabbi, many thanks, because the rabbi is responsible for everything that comes forth. So if I got up and said something outrageous, y'all could rightly blame him. Uh, but I promise that I won't. Uh, actually, I can say that this has been on my heart for many months. I approached a rabbi even probably two months ago about it. And today is a day, and as I've been listening and kind of feeling what the Holy Spirit's telling us through these high holy day seasons, it's right in line with the, some of what we're talking about this morning is right in line with what God is trying to tell us this high holy day season. So I definitely believe that, it, that it's of the Lord. Uh, and the title actually came together last night, Jealous of What? And so that's what we're going to be looking forward to um, this morning. So again, thank you. To start off with, I have a couple little helpers whom I need to help me with something. Can they come forward, please? Oh, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. When the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Don't worry, girls, I'm speaking lies. <laughs> This one's definitely sprung from purgatory. Uh oh, what's the other lady? <laughs> that was a well known saying that was said during the practice of selling indulgences by Johann Tetzel during the, uh, well, just prior to the Protestant Reformation, which brought to fame a well-known, or little-known at that time, German monk named Martin Luther, who was protesting the excesses of religion in his day. And But I don't want anybody to think that we're just here to pick on one. We can pick on anybody. Who remembers the, uh, the PTL club from the 70s and the 80s? What did PTL stand for? Nope. Pass the loot. <laughs> That's what I heard anyway. These are two very mild examples of religion perpetrating robbery upon us. In these cases, it was robbery of money. Money comes and goes, who cares? It's worthless anyway, right? But what we need to be concerned about is the robbery of people's souls. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, especially as we look at what we're supposed to be jealous of. But I want everybody to keep this in mind as we're going throughout. It is not just the other religion that is bad or false. Most everybody knows my background personally, and those for don't, I'm going to do a real brief, quick synopsis of it. I was raised in a Jewish, in a Reformed Jewish family where you could be almost anything you wanted spiritually. 
except believing in Yeshua. That's right. I could believe in nothing. I don't have to believe in God. I could believe in Buddha and call myself a Jew boo. <laughs> and all that would be fine and dandy, but not Yeshua. But God had other things in mind, and he started sending people my way. I didn't realize this. And I, I would say by the time I was 14 or 15, I, I was at least pretty well thinking, you know, I think Jesus might be the Messiah. And then one day, some of the other religious traditions do this. We had a confirmation class in the 10th grade. So I was in my sophomore year in high school, and I'm sitting in a confirmation class at the Reformed Jewish Synagogue. And the rabbi, he was teaching this particular session. And he said he was going to share with us passages from the scripture, which Christians say point to the Messiah. Rabbi is going to share with us one such passage. This changed my life. And you'll see how in just... Mind you, I was pretty, I was thinking Yeshua might be the Messiah. Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> Who would have believed our report? And to whom had the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shot up right forth as a sapling, and as a root out of the dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness that we should look upon him, nor beauty that we should delight in him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man pains and acquainted with disease. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely our diseases he did bear, and our pains he carried. Whereas we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep did go astray, we turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had made to light of him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, though he humbled himself, and opened not his mouth, as a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before his shearers is dumb. Yea, he opened not his mouth. Amen. So I was hearing this, never heard such a thing before, after all we didn't really read the scripture that much. And what was in my head, I still remember sitting there, that's why I took a seat, sitting there and in my head I was saying, Jesus really is the Messiah. That changed me forever and more than I could have thought, it was years later, I was even in the Messianic movement already. And the Lord showed me, I was confirming you in your faith in Yeshua. So even in confirmation in a Reformed Jewish synagogue, the Lord was using that in a Reformed rabbi to confirm you. I might just point out, you know, should be pretty obvious. The rabbi really did wasn't intending for that to happen. You know, <laughs> he's not listening. <laughs> Three years later, I accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as my Messiah, the age of 19. I was in college, and I could feel like I could take the yoke of my religion of Judaism off of me. What I didn't realize at that time was I was just taking up the yoke of another religion, at least for that season. We're certainly not going to stand here and knock all religions today. Because religions are equal. Because they all involve this one thing. Man's attempt to reach God. That's not what we're concerned about. Because our attempts to reach God end in exactly what was being addressed in, De in, in Deuteronomy. Disaster. Because our hearts aren't for God. What we need to be concerned with is, is what God did to reach us and all mankind. 
It's not just the people in our group or our religion. He did it for all mankind. I need the help of a couple of uh, construction-minded men. Maybe Jeremy. Michael, would you want to help me out? I need a little help up here. We have a con I have a quandary. I have this little box, gentlemen, and what I want to do is I want to put this Bima in that box. <laughs> now, how do you think we can do this? It looks a little big for this box. We could get a hammer. We could burn it and put the ashes in there. Do you think we could grind it and put it into sawdust and, and have that? Okay. The only thing is, is though, if we burn it, then, then we don't have the Bema anymore. You know, we're really, we're, we're sunk here, aren't we? Oh my gosh. All right. Maybe we need another box. Okay. This is what we do with religion. This is what religion does. It takes God, which is far too big, to box up. And we put him in a box. But why are we doing that? Because we're evil? Well, maybe. And because we're stupid? Because we don't know any better? Well, maybe that's part of it. But I think that the scripture reveals to us why he does it. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, it tells us this. And Daniel puts it up on the screen for me. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Our minds can't really conceive of God. And so we have religion to help us to be able to conceive of him for a season. Okay? The problem is, is we always want to make it for a lot more than a season. That's why I said when I accepted Yeshua, I was exchanging one religion for another, for a season. It's what I needed at that season. And that's what we're doing. Our atheist friends look at religion and they might muse that religion is foolish. It's caused so much trouble among men because some of the most evil and foolish things have been done in its name. And we all totally agree with them on that, don't we? However, mankind tends to fail to realize that outside of this religious box, God exists according to everything that he laid out and revealed in his word to us. Now, we have to get to what it really laid out in there because also cloaked inside of religion, we always have Bible verses which we use to try to back up some of the things that we say. And we're going to be looking at some of these today. As a Jewish believer, I wish I had a hundred dollars for every time I've heard statements like, how can you be both religions? Both Jewish and Christian? How does this work? You can't be both a Jew and a Christian. Everyone has to have their own religion. Or my best one. You're trying to steal my religion and call it your own. And yes, someone actually said that to me. I was much more gracious than this, but my response to that is, Really? If I were going to start stealing something, the last thing it would be is a religion. In reality... If we are believers in the one true living God of the universe, given to us by yod heh vav -Hey, up there on the back, through his chosen Mashiach, Yeshua, what difference does it make what label we put on it? So what religion am I? I don't care. Another example of all this probably even far more than mine could ever be, because he lived in a different time, is the late Romanian Jewish believer Richard Wormbrand. In one of his books, he recounted 
when he first came to faith in Jesus, going to a couple of priests in Romania to learn more about Jesus. He was told, no, Jesus is not for the Jews. He's for us. One of them was so angry that he actually struck Wormbrandt with a cane. Religion says a Jew can't believe in Jesus. But that's rather interesting, considering what Jesus says in, his, in a parable in Matthew 15, verses 22 to 24. If you have a moment, turn there with me. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried out unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And the daughter was made whole from that very hour. He said he came unto whom? He didn't even respond to the woman at first. That doesn't sound very Christian. He didn't even respond to her at first because he came to whom? Only the lost sheep of the house of Israel, when she humbled herself and showed that her faith was genuine, then she got what she was granted, showing that, oh, indeed, he did come for all people, but his purpose, main mission, was to come to the lost sheep of, house, of the house of Israel. It is also what we read in Romans. In our, uh, in our Messianic writings portion, when Paul writes in Romans 11 uh, that, that it was for the Jews first. And in Romans 1.16, he says the power of God, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for anyone who believes, for the Jew first, and then for the Gentile. Let's look at some other instances, and this is up on the screen, right, Dan? <laughs> of what religion tells us versus what God's Word tells us. For one thing, honoring the Shabbat. What are some of the things that religion tells us? He changed it, right? It doesn't really matter. Pick your own day. Okay? That was then, this is now. We're under grace. Pick your poison there, right? Because that's exactly what it is. Because in Exodus, when he commands to observe the Shabbat, first off, he spends far more time commanding the Shabbat than he did any other commandment. What were the consequences of not honoring the Shabbat? Death. Okay? Being cut off from one's people. These were pretty grave consequences. Is that what we could be teaching other people when we say, uh, you're not under that anymore, don't worry about that? Possibly. I can say. Another thing, Rabbi mentioned it uh, earlier this morning. Old Testament versus New Testament. Oh, isn't this a good one? What does religion tell us? <laughs> That was in the Old Testament. That was back then. That's what they had to do. But we're under the New Testament now. 
right? The mean God versus the nice, that, that's why it was death, right? Because he was mean. He changed his very nature, right? I don't think so. But what does God's word say about it? First off, I'm still looking into Tanakh anywhere where it says, and thus God made the old covenant with the people. I've never seen the word old covenant in the entire Tanakh unless I look at the beginning of my Bible where man so artfully added Old Testament page in front of it. Which, by the way, mine is not out of there because it, it's not in there anymore because uh, one uh, Shabbat school class, I had the kids scribble out the words nicely, Old Testament, and write Tanakh in the front of it. Because that's what we have. We have a Tanakh. We have his writings. God made many covenants with his people. The Noahic covenant. The Adamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. The Mosaic covenant. The Levitical covenant. One thing we know about God, because he tells us this in, in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, he keeps his promises and he keeps his covenant. So, I'm a little bit worried if all of a sudden, well, that, that was then. Now we're under a, a new covenant. In other words, God broke his covenant. Can I expect the floodwaters to be coming up any time now? Maybe, right? Because if he's a covenant-breaking God, we might have floodwaters any time. But that's not what he is. He is a covenant-keeping God. Kind of related off to this is the next one, dual covenant theology. Actually, I believe that the Roman Catholic Church today more embraces this than what they have in the past. And in an attempt to be tolerant, I believe, it says, well, the Jews have their covenant. Okay? And, and that's good for them. You know, the, the Old Testament, you know, that's good. And they can have that, you know, and they can do that. They can reach God with that. Uh, but we have the new covenant. That, that's ours. Okay. We have Jesus in the new covenant. There's a problem with that, though, in the scripture. Let's look at, and we're actually going to read these because this is a very key point. From Jeremiah chapter 31. Verses 31 to 33. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. What are the big problems we read in there then with dual covenant? First off, who was this new covenant made with? It's right there in the scripture. The house of Israel, and if that's not enough, the house of Judah. Um, what line is it again that Yeshua came out of? Yeah, yeah, that's right, the house of Judah. Not the house of Levi, the house of Judah. He made a covenant with them. Did it say in there, but you know what, they broke it, so I'm breaking it too. Back with it. No. They broke the covenant. God did it. When he makes the covenant with us, it's us who breaks it, not him. <coughs> Lastly, he says he'll write the law in our inward hearts. He didn't say abolish it. Make it of no effect. Put it in our inward hearts. So are we going to do it less or are we going to do it more? Well, hopefully we'll do it more. You know, if you look at human history, I don't know that that's exactly but we have the ability to do it more because we have the Holy Spirit with us as our helper. And 
we're all the more accountable, therefore, too. Lastly, how about holiday observance? And we won't beat this up too badly. What holidays do we observe? Well, religion tells us, you know what, if you're Jewish and you have that Old Testament stuff, yeah, you can keep those feasts, you know, back then, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. What's those all about, by the way? You know, yeah, oh, I see you're building that little tabernacle out there, you know, people, that's good for you. But we, we in, in, under the, the new covenant now, we'll build our Christmas tree, right? Go on Easter bunny hunts. These are our holiday observances now. Well, what's the scripture say about that? Well, just like I'm still looking for the old covenant in the Tanakh, I'm looking for anywhere in the entire scripture where it even mentions Christmas. There is possibly one chapter in Acts that's translated in the King James as Easter. Even if we assume that that was the correct translation, and it, I believe it's possible, it definitely was not talking about the remade Christian festival. It was talking about the pagan festivals observed by Rome at that time, and that's if it was. But you can't say because in the early, uh, in the early languages, what they used as Easter was like the equivalent of Passover. If you look at the Latin languages today, the word for Easter and the word for Passover is almost synonymous, like in Spanish and French and languages like that. But anyway, what does he say about our holiday observances in Leviticus 23 when we talk about what we know as the Feast of the Lord or our Moedim? Yeah, here's another one of these themes. I believe Rabbi has maybe mentioned it once or twice. Perpetual statute throughout all of your generations. What's perpetual statute? Unending? Wait a second. I, I thought that was gone. Done. Maybe for the Jews if they choose to do it. It's unending throughout all your generations. Same thing again, right? Let's look at our Torah portion from Deuteronomy, and again it was echoed in Romans. The people being provoked to jealousy by them that are a non-people, the scripture says. Them that are not a people. Sandwich. 
At this donut at Passover time. You don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. That's what Christ died for. You like our new Christmas tree? We got these new ornaments here. When my former wife and I first got married, we bought a live tree. Oh, we were so happy with a live tree. We weren't happy sweeping up pine needles for two months afterwards. But that was like, the bigger, the better, the more alive, how wonderful it is. Think about it. If I, a Jew, was provoked to jealousy by that, what does it say about the Jewishness that I grew up in? It says that we had so long since forsaken the oracles of God, what it meant to be a follower of God, that what Christianity had looked closer to the real thing. That's really being provoked to jealousy. We also look at examples throughout history of horrible persecutions by the Jewish people, by people who would claim that God had now rechosen them and that the Jews were done away with. St. Augustine used to say that the Jews were forsaken of God and they should be kept around but taxed to death so that they could always be an example of what it was to be accursed by God. But the Orthodox Jews at the time loved him. Why would you love him? Because he said, but let them live. Other, other contemporaries of his at that time said the Jews were fit for nothing except to be killed. These are churchmen, fit for nothing except to be killed. But, but Augustine said, let them live. This is an example of being provoked to jealousy by them that are not a people. As we look at the text earlier, it indeed was not a favorable thing that God was going to provoke us to jealousy. It wasn't his way of showing us the new true faith. It was a way of showing us what we had done to him, that we had provoked him to jealousy and anger by worshiping non-gods. It was more of a vengeance is mine says the Lord thing. That's what it was. That's not a favorable thing. Now if he will use it, this would be the correct attitude among our, our brethren in the, in the church, among Christians. The correct attitude would be, it's sad that it had to be that way, but if he can use that to bring the people back to their God, then that's a good thing. And so, contrary to beating up on them, I'm very thankful for brethren in the church. They helped me to see. When I first got in the Messianic movement and, and I saw this, I was like, wow, this is what it meant all the time. I would ask the Lord, why nine years? Why nine years in the church? Why couldn't I come to this right now? And the Lord would tell me, I had to teach you first to love Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. I believe that if I would have seen some of these religious rites, and yet we still do them, religious rites, tashlich, parading the Torah around, reading the Torah, pointing at just the right time, none of these are commanded things in the scripture either, wearing the kippah, etc. Choose our little observance. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not knocking it. But if I'd have seen that, I believe that I might have been attracted back okay, to the trappings of religion. Right. That's not what God had for me. He had something far much better. And I believe that he has it for all people. And that is to bring all people to salvation through Yeshua. First, to the, lost of the, to the house of the lost house of Israel. That's what it was to provoke them to jealousy. To bring them back to the lost house of Israel. 
And what we should be doing is trying to return the favor, if you will, a little bit to the church. Help them see, because they've been robbed too. Amen. They've been robbed too. Our people, they, there are people in churches, many, who love God with all their hearts, minds, and soul. I've met them. They've helped me. They've blessed me. Huge blessing to me in my faith walk. Sometimes I call them first when I would need something. Because their hearts are right with the Lord. And I believe that when they see these things, when they can see these things like the Shabbat, Okay, like we made pagan festivals. Okay, Easter versus Passover. Really? How are you going to choose to do the resurrection? Easter, Easter eggs and bunny and bunnies, or what Yeshua was doing at the time, what he was instituting. Now, if you're a believer in the one true living God, that's going to be a no-brainer right there. That's what we need to do. That's what our mission needs to be. First, to reach out to help them to see if, if my people can be provoked to jealousy by them that are not a people or that were not a people but now are in the church who are still doing some of these things that we've discussed, how much more might he be provoked to jealousy by some of you who once were not a people, but now are a people, and who know it in its highest form. Amen. I'm the Torah. Amen. That's what you were meant to be. Who was the first convert to, to Judaism, or one of the first? Ruth. What did she say? Naomi, thanks for introducing me to your God. Now, I'm going to take him into my Boabite religion. And we'll have a new beautiful religion out of it. That's not what she said. When something like, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. That's what it was meant to be, to come to faith in the one true living God. This, pro this provocation to jealousy was not God forsaking his people. As we look at... In Zechariah 8.23, this will be one of the verses that I close with here as we look at it. And this is so rich. Zechariah 8.23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. God's not forsaken. God, it, this isn't an example of God forsaking his people and showing us what's the true faith. This is an example of maybe we can be brought back because we, God had to provoke us to jealousy. But at the same time, now we can help these other people see it so that in those days, and I believe those days are coming very soon, how many agree with me? Very soon. That they can be among those people that say, I want to grab the hand of the because we've heard that God is with you. Let's just get yeah, exactly the CC. I'll use that as an illustration. Stand up, brother. I'll be one from the nation. I want to grab hold of your seat. See, I've heard that God is with you. Let me just say, he's not a reformed Jew. That would tell me I could be a Jew boo. <laughs> <laughs> that God doesn't care if I believe in him or not. This is a Jew who's following me after and observing the mitzvot. Maybe he's one that God had to provoke to jealousy by them that were not a people, like me. Maybe it's a brother who saw that even though once he was not a people, now he is a people. Yeah. And by the way, when, you're a, when you were not a people and now you are a people, you're on equal footing. Right. Daniel had up Galatians in the beginning. Those were verses in Galatians. 
where God said, there's no more Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or free male. We are all one in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. And that includes our brethren in the church in Christianity who love the Lord with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's what we're after. It's not about religion. It's about following after the Lord. That's what we need to be about. I believe that what we've touched on, rabbis touched on, let's stop trying to put God in a box. This bima is not going to fit in a box no matter how hard we try. That's good. And if we did burn it, we won't have the bima anymore. So what good do we have? If we put God in the box, he's not going to be any good to us. And remember what I said in the beginning. It's not just the other guy's religion who's the bad one. We have all been guilty of putting God in the box. Sometimes we're still doing it. Because we're still in this flesh. We've got to stop doing that. Follow after the one true living God. One thing, and this is the last point. We prayed a new blessing at Yom Kippur. A blessing of encouraging God to move on to people, to bring them to salvation. We said it first in Hebrew and then in English. I came in here on Yom Kippur and I prayed that blessing for my family, my friends. I called them out by name before. I called the Jewish people of this community out, not by name, not, you know, all 1,000 of them or whatever by name, but Jews of this community. Called them out by name before the Lord. This is the kind of thing that we can be doing, and we can be a witness. And we can be a witness to them. Amen. And we can provoke them to jealousy, but in a good way. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, to share what the Lord puts on my heart. And so please rise. It's interesting that there's a diaspora. Of Jewish people, you know, God scattered his people all over the, the world, and there is a, a, there, there's a regathering that's taking place of coming back to the promise. Amen. But remember, Rabbi Shaul was sent out to the, the non-Jews as well, and the I believe that there's a regathering of them as well, which is at the heart that's right. of what Rick was sharing, a regathering of us as well that are not Jewish, back to the truth. And the thing we have to be very, very careful with, and you know, I, I believe that was the heart of the message is, is that we often think we can get tripped up or even muddy by tradition. And we start to busy ourselves with the accoutrements or the, the, the traditions and lose sight of the God of the tradition. And Judaism has done that. Um, and that was Vic's caution to himself as he looked back at least that the delay that he experienced coming into the Messianic movement, or at least this kind of expression, was perhaps that he would really know he who is the Torah, yes. he, Yeshua. And yet we see in the church today brothers and sisters who claim the Messiah, but have recreated the Messiah. They've created their own Messiah. And so there is a, there is a, a, a regathering that has taken place back to what I felt the, the Holy Spirit imparted upon me, which is, you know, returning to what is true, and it was pure, and what is righteous, and what is uncluttered. Um, and so the diaspora of both Jew and Gentile is assembling in these days. We are, we are a kegelot of Jew and Gentile, one Messiah. We are coming back. We are coming back to that heart of worship, that, that, that place of, of pure worship of Yeshua, who is the Word. They are one and the same. And that's where we need to head, and that's where we need to go. And we will continue to, to regather, just as the gospel was for the lost sheep of Israel, but also Rabbi Shul went to the Gentiles.
Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you again. Obviously, you can, we've all seen, Lord, that, that we can be used by you. Um, maybe we're not all the rabbi, or maybe we're not all the pastor, or, but Father, you've imparted each one of us, Father, with a unique calling and gifting. And there are seasons, Father, where we are called to step up, to be a voice in darkness. And I thank you for Shamash, Potus, Father, who has a heart for you, a heart for his people, and uh, a, a devotion, Father, to bringing this good news to his people as well. And we see the fruit of that in his children. Um, that is the evidence of a man who is not only a speaker of your word, but a liver of it. Uh, perfect? No, I don't think any of us have, uh, any of us have always hit the mark. Uh, I, I know, Lord, I'm probably the worst shot here with all the Antiochus. But I can tell you, Father, I can tell you in Yeshua's name, Lord, that we are still going to the range. We're still picking up the word, and we're still aiming, Father, that truth. Uh, we're doing our best for what you've been giving us. And so, that's, I thank you for everyone that is here, Father, has that moment. And many more, Father, I pray that you, we are the voices in the darkness, that we go forth. We don't take anything with us. Uh, no preconceived ideas or traditions, just that, that good news, that hope of Messiah. Father, apart from that, there is no truth, there is no way, there is no life. So thank you again, Father. We pray that many more of us, Father, have uh, received, Father, Words of anointing and inspiration from you, Father.